to uh, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, and we'll read at verse 20. And uh, while you're looking that up, I'll just mention next uh, Sunday, the uh, speaker in the morning, George Sturm, is a, uh, an American missionary to Albania. Uh, actually, he divides his time between Albania and North Korea, but with the present situation, has not been able to visit North Korea, so he's staying in Albania. And he'll be speaking to us from Albania. He'll actually just be speaking in the morning. I'll, I'll be taking the evening uh, meeting. And uh, he is in an area where uh, north of where we were, uh, the team that went out uh, two years ago uh, to uh, Albania. He's uh, in another part of the country there, but he comes, I believe, from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and has been there for a number of years. So we'll look forward to hearing him. He'll be coming to us uh, from Albania next Sunday morning. Matthew 18 and verse 20, it reads, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. A couple of uh, weeks ago now, or maybe a little longer than that, Marlene and I were uh, over visiting at Anita's, and I happened to notice in sitting in her living room there, a little plaque she had, and it was called The Gathering. And it struck me that term, the gathering, that, that really would be a good name for a local church. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, innovative names that are applied to churches these days and, uh, and maybe Bible chapel is a little old fashioned, I don't know, but uh, I thought the gathering is a very good way of describing uh, a local church. So this morning, I'd like to consider this with you a little bit and consider it under uh, three uh, aspects. Number one, we have been gathered. Number two, we are to gather. Number three, we shall be gathered. The past, the present, and the future of our gathering. We have been gathered. God is interested in gathering people. In the Old Testament, for example, with regards to Israel, we read that they were gathered. Uh, here's a few examples, Leviticus 8 and 4, and Moses did as the Lord commanded them, and the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. Or Numbers 10 and 2, make the two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And there are several other examples uh, in the Old Testament where it makes reference to God gathering his uh, people. It's sad when we come to the New Testament and we discover that Israel refused the call for gathering uh, when the Lord was there. I hear his words from Matthew 23 and 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. We notice this call of the Lord to gather was for their own protection and their own benefit, as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings. And yet, here's an example where it was possible for God's people to refuse his call uh, to gather, and consequences follow such refusal. Uh, the Lord said he left with the nation of Israel, he, that he was going to leave their house to them desolate. And it's a turning point in the New Testament that it, it, it speaks to us of, uh, of the fact that the Lord left without establishing his kingdom because Israel would not re receive him. The condition upon which he will establish his kingdom is stated that Israel must receive him and welcome him as her Messiah. And so that's what the prophets speak of. And that's what the New Testament tells us, that one day he's going to come again. And they will this time welcome him in their desperation at the close of the tribulation period. And he will come again and establish uh, his kingdom. And they will be glad of it then. But now they've rejected it. It's possible for God's people to reject is called uh, to gather. In the New Testament, at the formation of the church, uh, the church was called together. 
Uh, we know many of these verses well, Acts 2 and 40, and many with many other words did he, that is Peter, testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and all had things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them all to every man, uh, to, to men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Here we find that the very uh, embryonic stage of the church, when these initial Jews became believers in Christ, and uh, they immediately in these early stages uh, saw the importance of gathering uh, together. Of course, they were living in difficult circumstances, and they took a bold stand for Christ against all that their fellow countrymen uh, had, had stood for. They, they were going against the grain, so to speak, and so naturally they saw the, the importance of, of gathering together uh, these initial Jews in Jerusalem. And in the New Testament, we see as the church developed from these initial stages, in the New Testament, we see that the, the, the churches are a gathering of people. That is, faith in Christ introduces us to a fellowship of people. We don't just live in isolation as individual believers uh, who accept Christ as our Savior and then go on in isolation. In the New Testament, believers are gathered together. We've been gathered together, firstly, as the part of the universal church. Now, that term universal church is not a Bible term, but it's a, it's a phrase that's been coined to describe the fact that every person who knows Christ as their savior is part of the church all over the world. And every believer from the day of Pentecost to the time of the rapture of the church is part of the universal church. And we have a connection with every believer who was, is, and will be in this church age. And we know that certainly living in this uh, part of the uh, country, this part even of the province of Ontario, there are a lot of Christians uh, that are not part of our local fellowship, but we run into all, of, we run into Christians all over the place. If you've lived and worked here for any length of time, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, there are Christians uh, everywhere. But we've also been called to gather in a local church fellowship that is a defined local church, such as we have here at Brockview, and there are other local churches uh, throughout Niagara. And of course, all over the world. And this is the practical level. In other words, being part of the universal church is a truth that we must remember. We have something common with every believer, but the gathering of the local church starts to bring uh, practical things into our lives. We actually will meet physically uh, together and be, we'll be engaged with one another. I can't be engaged with the universal church on a practical level, but I can be engaged in a local church uh, in the at a practical level. Uh, and so the question is, are you part of the fellowship? Are you part of a local church fellowship? Uh, th that, that's not sort of a, a loosey-goosey, vague kind of a thing to be part of a fellowship. It means to, to make a, a, a commitment to a local church fellowship not just sort of hopping all over the place to any kind of church and going to whoever has the best program that night or the best preacher that night, but being part of one particular local church fellowship. That doesn't mean we don't visit other places as, on, as occasion demands it, but, but, but our main connection is with a particular local church. Are you in local church fellowship? I expect most of you that are listening here this morning are, but if you're not, it's important to make that, that connection. And that can be done. We have a process at Brockview whereby uh, if you'd like to become part of the fellowship that uh, we arrange a meeting with a couple of the elders to uh, just find out about, about you and about uh, the authenticity of your faith in Christ. Uh, we're not looking for perfect people, uh, but we are looking for those who want to be part of a local church fellowship. And so if you're not part of the local fellowship, then you need to think about that. Young people need to think about that. 
because your parents are part of the assembly doesn't automatically make you part of the assembly. And if you're a believer and you've been baptized and uh, you need to think about uh, making that commitment to be part of a local church fellowship. 22 books of the New Testament are written to churches or about churches. In addition to the book of Acts, which is about the historical development uh, of the church. So it's evident that God's purpose uh, these days is that we have been gathered. As believers in Christ, uh, we are gathered together. But then presently, we are to gather. We have been gathered uh, through faith in Christ, but we are to gather. That is on a practical level. In Hebrews 10, 10 and 24, uh, Paul read it this morning. I always get nervous when somebody at the Lord's Supper starts to read verses that uh, uh, I, I plan on speaking on. I'm afraid he was going to steal all my thunder. So, uh, Paul, don't, don't read verses I'm going to preach on. You're supposed to know what I'm supposed to preach on, you see. Uh, Acts 10 and, or uh, Hebrews 10 uh, and uh, 24, and these are familiar words to us. Uh, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we already read in Acts chapter 2, the church, the early church, immediately and continually gathered. Their purpose in Acts was for doctrine, for fellowship, for the breaking of bread, and for prayers. And the writer to Hebrews here adds, uh, in order to stir up love and good works. So these are all benefits. These are all things that will happen when we gather together. And they happen in a way that can't be reproduced in isolation. This is the primary sphere where gift is exercised in local church fellowship gathered together. In other words, uh, we know that the church is, has been gifted by the Holy Spirit with individuals given different gifts. And we've all been given a gift. And that gift is designed that we might contribute to the building up of the body. And that tells me that I, as an individual believer, no matter how much time I read my Bible or pray or listen to videos or whatever else I would do in isolation, I do not possess all that is necessary for my own edification and building up. I need the connection and fellowship of other believers because none of us possess all the gifts necessary for our spiritual health and growth. And it's in the gathering where these gifts are primarily uh, exercised. When we lead, for example, in public prayer, uh, we usually speak in terms of we, not I. When a man stands and prays publicly at our gathering, he is, he is, in a sense, representing all of us. He is praying on behalf of all of us. It's not his own personal prayer life. And generally, we don't pray with things like the, use the word I, but we use the word we. We speak representatively because it is a gathered uh, company. The gathering of believers has a, has a uh, sanctifying and in encouraging and challenging effect upon us. It really is an antidote to coldness and worldliness. Coldness and worldliness thrive in isolation. But when we're gathered together, there is a sanctifying effect as we sing hymns, as we listen to the word being preached. That can't be reproduced in in isolation. Public preaching in a gathered company has a force that can't be recreated uh, in videos or, or virtual meetings. As much as we're trying to do these things, they're, they're, they're supplements, uh, but they're not a substitute in the long run. We need to bear this in mind. I really applaud the courage of those who meet today, uh, who, who presently meet both here uh, and in other places around the world. And through the history of the church, we've seen this. People that have met, uh, they, they, they meet on the basis that Jesus Christ is head of the church. They, they don't meet according to uh, government approval. They meet because Jesus Christ is head of the church. And you read in church history and you will read of believers who, 
who, who suffered violent persecution uh, for things that we take for granted today, owning their own copy of the Bible in some places, practicing believers' baptism in some places. And even in the present day, in many parts of the world, uh, believers uh, meet together, even though their lives uh, are at risk. Uh, the public preaching of the word of God in a gathered company as a force uh, that cannot be recreated in isolation. Evidently, some in the early church were abandoning meeting. Verse 25 uh, it says that, that we are not to forsake the assembling ourselves together, as is the manner uh, of some. Uh, the uh, a Greek, uh, a Greek scholar, A.T. Robertson, he translates this, uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together uh, this way. He says, uh, it could read, not leaving in the lurch. <laughs> and that, that is a very forceful way of saying it. Uh, if you had arranged for help, perhaps, with someone, young people like to do this when they move, they gather all their friends together to help them move. Well, imagine if your moving day came along and and uh, you had your friends who said, yes, I'll be there, I'll, I'll come and help you move. And and you get up that morning all ready to start your move and, and none of your friends show up. Uh, they, they left you in the lurch, uh, not a very pleasant experience. And so it is in gathering together to forsake the assembling of ourselves together is to leave others in the lurch. We might not think about that. We might think we come to a meeting and we're kind, uh, we're kind of anonymous in the whole situation. We just sort of slip in and slip out, and and maybe we're we don't take part publicly. That's not our gift, or or if we do, we're not scheduled to to take part. And we might think that 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 we have no role to play. But but we all have a role to play as a body of believers. That's why a local fellowship is a defined company. It, it it's an important thing to become part of a fellowship. And you may not be a person who gets up on any occasion to speak publicly, but you're still part of the fellowship are needing and your absence leaves us in the lurch. We may not notice it. It may not be obvious, but it's there. And so this is the idea of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Verse 26 goes on in the next section. The writer links it. He says in verse 26, for... If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And he goes on to the consequences of this. Now, there are different views as to who he's speaking about here in the book of Hebrews. Some believe that he's speaking about what we call apostates, those who never really put their faith in Christ and were only professing to be believers in Christ. And he's speaking about those. Uh, others believe that that the writer to the Hebrews is speaking about uh, the idea of immature believers, uh, that, that these warnings are directed to believers who are not maturing in Christ, are not taking their Christian life seriously and growing. Well, regardless of which view you take, the consequences that follow here in this section are not pleasant to say the least, but it's connected to absenteeism in local church uh, fellowship. Again, we quote E.T. Robertson. He says, already some Christians had formed the habit of not attending public worship, a perilous habit then and now. Now we must hurry on. Uh, the third idea is the future. We've looked at the past. We have been gathered. We've looked at the present. We are to gather. And the third idea is the future. We shall be gathered. We shall be gathered. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. And we read verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together uh, to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped 
so that he sits, it, uh, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Our gathering together uh, to him. Now, we teach here at Brockview a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial rapture of the church. We believe that the church will be raptured before the prophesied tribulation era and before the millennial reign of Christ. And the rapture is the hope of the church. That is, it is God's purpose to come and to rapture, to take us away, to gather us up together uh, with him. It's going to be a marvelous thing. We know some detail of it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. It will release us from this world. It will resurrect some of us, those that have died believing in Christ. It will transform us. We shall all be changed, Paul says. And it will, we, it will reunite us. It will bring us together, particularly with those that have died believing in Christ. It will be a rapture, a carrying away. We shall be caught up. The Greek scholar Vincent puts it this way. We shall be caught up by a swift, resistless, divine energy. That's a great expression, a swift, resistless, divine energy, a supernatural event when we will be carried away to go to be with the Lord. Now, as I mentioned, it will precede the tribulation. And this was a confusion of the Thessalonians. Uh, it, it says in verse two of our chapter that you, you're not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from you as though the day of Christ had come. Now, most experts on the study of the, the original languages will tell us that this, this expression, the day of Christ, should actually read the day of the Lord. And what Paul is saying here is that the Thessalonians were getting concerned that the day of the Lord had already come. And they understood the day of the Lord to mean the day when God is going to initiate the judgment of the tribulation era. And they thought that, that it had already started, was beginning to start, and they had missed the rapture. And so they were, they were obviously shaken in mind or troubled in spirit. And so Paul uses the occasion. Uh, he says, you'd be troubled in spirit or by word or by letter as if from us. In other words, there were false uh, epistles being uh, written and circulated. They were forgeries uh, supposedly signed by Paul or made to look like they were signed by Paul. And that, so they thought that through these false documents, Paul had been telling them that they were going to go through the tribulation. He says that's not the case, that the tribulation will uh, begin when some of these things uh, appear. That day will not come unless a falling away, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist that will appear. The, the, the tribulation will not begin until these things actually happen. And so the Thessalonians should not have been concerned that they had missed the rapture or there was going to be no rapture or that the rapture would, would occur after uh, the tribulation period. This was the confusion of the second coming. It's The rapture is not the second coming of Christ spoken by the Old Testament uh, prophets and by the Lord himself. In the Old Testament, when we read about the coming of the Lord, it's not referring to the rapture. Most of the Lord's ministry, uh, with one exception perhaps, when he spoke about his coming and when the disciples spoke about his coming, they were not talking about the rapture. The church was not established at that point. The only reference we have to the rapture in the ministry of the Lord is in John 14, where he spoke about, uh, he said, if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's the first reference we have to the rapture of the church. But when he was speaking with the disciples, he wasn't speaking to them as members of the church. He was speaking to them as Jews, talking about his second coming at the close of the tribulation. Now, this leads us to uh, think about 
this idea of thinking about the rapture, there are no signs preceding the rapture given in scripture. Uh, signs are in relation to the second coming. We hope to Lord willing later in the summer speak about the Lord's Olivet Discourse when he speaks about this. And, and oftentimes you'll hear uh, preachers and, and Christians will speak about the various signs that are occurring and they'll say the Lord's coming must be very near. But those signs have nothing to do with the rapture. Those are signs for those living in the tribulation period and will be looking for the second coming uh, of Christ. There are no signs given to the, uh, to the rapture. Uh, sometimes you'll hear Christians say, well, the Lord's coming must be very near. Well, that may be true, but we don't know that. I have a commentary uh, I've been looking at uh, in connection with some other messages that I've been preparing on the book of Matthew, written by uh, a man by the name of Schuyler English. If you, that name would be familiar to those of you who have Schofield reference Bibles. If you look at the detail, he was the editor of the uh, the 1967 edition of the Schofield Reference Bible, and he was a, uh, a, a well-known preacher in the United States, the Philadelphia area, and a good Bible student, and his commentary is excellent, and he writes in, in connection with the signs, he says, we look around and we see the Lord's coming must be very soon. The only problem is that was written in 1935, and he was looking at world events in the 1930s in the precursor to the Second World War, and he interpreted those as an indication that the Lord would be coming soon. Well, we're not dependent on signs to establish the truth of the rapture. The Lord is coming for his church. It's an established truth. It has really got nothing to do with signs. It's not made more true because we see certain political events, so we need to be careful. Now, I know some have reasoned, well, we see things that are characteristic of the tribulation, therefore it follows that the rapture must be very soon. And that may be true, but scripture does not reason it that way, and scripture does not present it that way. The rapture could occur at any moment. It's, it's described as being imminent. It could happen at any time. We used to see this little phrase frequently. It was on people's uh, fridge magnets, on people's fridges and plaques on their wall, perhaps today. And yes, we as Christians need to live in light of the rapture of the church. It could be today. And really, it takes great courage and faith to live that way every day. Maybe it won't happen in our lifetime. We don't know. But we are called to live as if it could happen today. And Paul instructed the Thessalonians to live this way in light of the rapture. We find it over in chapter 1. And we read in chapter 1, these words, verses 9 and 10, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says of the Thessalonians, for they themselves cons uh, declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What do the Thessalonians do? We noticed that they were working and they were waiting. They, they turned uh, to God. Uh, it says they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They were working. They were engaged in their work. And he encourages them to be working believers. They were serving God. They were working and they were waiting. And so while they were working, they were waiting to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. One day, we are going to be gathered together, together in the meeting in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We have been gathered, we are together, and we shall be gathered. Shall we pray? Father, how thankful we are for the gathering that God would be interested in gathering people, pe people who had no claim to be gathered, no right to be gathered, but through salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been made a child of God and brought into fellowship with one another in this church age. Help us, our Father, to treasure the value of the gathering of God's people and not to treat it lightly. Help us to think clearly and carefully about the particular present circumstances that we are now in that's hindering uh, the value of gathering together. We pray for God's people all over the world, some facing far more difficult circumstances than we are, as was mentioned earlier in prayer, places like the Congo and 
uh, many other parts of the or parts of the Middle East and and parts of Asia, uh, where it's a life-threatening situation to gather as God's people. Uh, we pray for these dear believers and applaud their courage uh, and their loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be an, an inspiration and challenge to all of us. I ask you to bless us now as we part for the time and we gather together again this evening in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate the message. I'm sure we all did. Uh, and uh, just one day we will uh, perhaps get back to some normality in our lives and we will uh, meet again. Um,